and turn with me, if you will, to that portion of Scripture which we read just a few moments ago over in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 49. The message today is entitled, The Cave of the Hittites. A rather um, interesting and I think very, very fascinating uh, thing to track as we go through the Scriptures and to track who in the world the Hittites were and how often they show up in the Word of God and what their connection is with Israel all the way from the days of Abraham, all the way through the Old Testament, we find references to the Hittites and in some very key passages of Scripture and key points in the history of Israel. You recall that last time we looked at the last half of the future of Israel in Genesis chapter 49, verses 25 through 28, where we saw God giving Joseph seven special blessings based on the covenant that God had made with Abraham back in earlier chapters of the book of Genesis. We saw uh, some repetition of things that were said to Isaac and to Jacob as well. But we saw that there were some blessings that are given to Joseph that were not stated prior to this time that God gives through Jacob a prophetic blessing to his son Joseph. We saw blessings of heaven above. That's the spiritual and unseen blessings that we talked about and God's ever watchful eye and continual presence. We saw the blessings of the deep that lieth under. Those are temporal blessings from the hidden things of the earth and from the sea. We saw the blessings of the breast and the blessings of the womb, sustenance as a mother with her child, and fruitfulness with many descendants. We saw blessings, and here was the one that was quite startling, and it's the fifth blessing, the number of grace in Scripture, blessings that are greater than the blessings of your ancestors and that will be passed down to your sons. I think that of the seven blessings that Jacob gives to Joseph, that is perhaps the most exciting of them. And then we saw blessings that last beyond the time of the everlasting hills, that is, blessings that would not pass away until the earth passes away. And we saw that there were many places in the prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament where these eternal blessings to Israel as a nation, and particularly to Jacob uh, and to Joseph, uh, extend all the way until the world is consumed in fire, as Peter tells us. Uh, some really exciting things there for national Israel. And then we saw that there was a, a blessing that was the only blessing of the seven uh, where a reason for the blessing was given. That last blessing was upon Joseph's head because of suffering and separation from his brothers. Uh, so there's a, a reason given for that blessing, whereas the rest of them are merely based upon the goodness and the good pleasure of God in his sovereignty, choosing Joseph and giving him some special blessings through Jacob. 
We talked about how God would help him, as Jacob promises here. There's the desperate need for a helper, Israel's petition for a helper that we looked at, and finally God, the only available helper. Behold, God is mine helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. And we saw that that is a promise that extends to us today. In the book of Hebrews, in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 13, where it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That's a great promise because of who God himself is, that he is our eternal helper. He is the one who has made promises to us. He is the one who has given gifts to us. And then we saw many different passages which showed us that you cannot escape the blessing of God if you do right, and you cannot escape the judgment of God if you do wrong. Rather interesting, God will chase you down with his blessings if you're doing what's right. Uh, wonderful promise in Deuteronomy 28 too. All these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. It will be like a rolling wave of blessings coming up behind you. You don't even see it coming and suddenly God overfloods you with his blessings uh, that you weren't expecting simply because you have obeyed his voice and hearkened unto the Lord your God. And then we saw the special curses on those who disobey him and who refuse his blessing. We saw that the blessing of the womb is equated with four other blessings that I think none of us would want to reject. Uh, we saw that the uh, heritage, the term heritage, used for children are in heritage of the Lord, is a term that is also used of the land as a heritage to Israel. Divine protection was the heritage of Israel. Spiritual blessing was the heritage of Israel. God's word was the heritage of Israel. And then it says, children are a heritage from the Lord. Uh, wonderful to compare the five different ways in which the term heritage is used in the Old Testament. And it always puzzles me as to why any would say, well, I like the first four, the land and divine protection and spiritual blessing and God's word, but I don't want children. <laughs> All five of those are put on the same plane as being an inheritance from God. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. Then we talked about the word progenitor, which showed up in that passage, the ancestor who's in a direct line, Jacob promising greater blessings than were even promised to the ancestors. And we saw then the promises concerning Benjamin in verse 27, uh, track the history of Benjamin uh, throughout the Old Testament and saw God fulfilling those promises to him. But today we look at this passage, verse 29 through 32. And the cave of the Hittites, here we find Abraham and Isaac and Jacob having a connection to a particular piece of real estate in the land of Israel. It's a place that is not far from modern day Hebron. It's a place that uh, has some very important burial uh, people buried in that. It says in verse 31, there they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah, and we'll find out a little bit later here in this text in Genesis chapter 50 that that's also where Jacob is buried. Six people buried in that cave. Rather interesting to know that today, over the cave of Machpelah, there is a Muslim mosque that has been built. And a shrine there to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their wives uh, that is honored by the Muslims, for they consider Abraham to be a prophet. Of course, they don't consider him to be a great prophet, as great as Muhammad, but it's under the control, once again, of unbelievers. As it was before Abraham bought it, it was belonging to the Hittites, now it is under control of the Muslims and of the Arabs. And so we will see some very interesting promises concerning a day when it will no longer be under control of those who are unbelievers in the true and living God. So the first question we need to ask ourselves as we approach this passage, because it talks about the uh, Hittites, it talks about uh, the children of Heth, it talks about Ephraim the Hittite, uh, it talks about this specific location which is in the land of Israel today. So who were the Hittites? Well now I think most Christians, if you ask them who were the Hittites, they would tell you, I don't know. 
I think there may have been some Hittites. Uh, I think I've read that word someplace in the Bible. But most Christians know nothing about the Hittites. And yet along with Egypt and Babylon and Assyria and Syria and Persia, the Philistines, the Canaanites, and a few others, they're one of the most frequently mentioned pagan nations in the entire Old Testament. Today, scholars consider the Hittites to be the third most influential of all of the ancient people of the Middle East. In fact, in about 1550, they destroyed the Babylonian capital of the great Hammurabi. You've all heard of Hammurabi's code, right? I mean, it's, it's something that the liberals are always trying to say, well, Moses copied Hammurabi's code. Uh, the Hittites actually destroyed Hammurabi, the king of Babylon, and destroyed his capital in 1550 B.C., in fact, the liberals for years denied the existence of the Hittites. Oh, they saw the references in the scripture to the Hittites, but they say, well, they were just a, probably a group of little nomads that ran around here and there, and Abraham just happened to run into some Hittites. And the other references in the Bible, well, they're insignificant, and there was no Hittite empire. Just a few Hittites here and there, and we're not even so sure we really ought to call them Hittites. Well, you know, the liberals are always trying to attack the Bible, and one of the great things about archaeology is after the liberals have made their definitive statements about how they don't believe the Bible because the Bible couldn't possibly be right, then God allows somebody to dig up something that demonstrates that not only the Bible was right, but the Bible was more than right. Uh, it was a sweeping empire. The Hittite Empire covered all of what we know today as Turkey. That's a pretty big empire for the Middle East. As a matter of fact, they were on an equal with Egypt. The reason we don't hear more about them is because Abraham and his descendants went south into Egypt. They didn't go north into Hittite territory. But the Hittites were there, and they were, in fact, a very powerful uh, group. Uh, the archaeology has put the case of the skeptics deeply to rest in a very deep grave. In 1906, a man by the name of Hugo Winkler, he was a German professor, was digging at an ancient tell. A tell is the word for uh, an ancient ruined city. There are these mounds in the Middle East where one city after another was built on top of other cities. And so it's like a man-made mountain as the city was destroyed and turned into rubble. Uh, people would come back and say, you know, that was a pretty good place to have a city because there's water here uh, and there's fields that can be plowed, so they would level it sort of off, rebuild the city, then it would get destroyed, and so on. And then you have these gigantic mounds in the Middle East called tells. Well, Hugo Winkler was digging at a place called Bogaz Koy, and um, he not only found remnants of the Hittite Empire, that happened to be the capital of the Hittite Empire. In fact, he not only discovered it as the capital, he dug right into the main library and archives of the empire and uncovered thousands and thousands of clay tablets written in what's called cuneiform, little wedge-shaped. They have these tablets made out of clay, and then they would bake them later. But to write on them, they would take a, a little triangular-shaped wedge and poke it in and make their letters with these little triangular wedges. And um, then they would bake the tablet, and that gave the record of things that were going on in the Hittite Empire. Well, he found thousands of those, and it was a massive empire that stretched all the way across Turkey and rivaled Egypt in power. Something else about the Hittites that's very interesting to notice, of course, before the flood, uh, the secret of smelting iron had been discovered, but after the flood, it was lost. And the Hittites were the first ones to rediscover how to smelt iron in the ancient world. And then it wasn't until about 200 years after that that the Phoenicians and Philistines discovered how to smelt iron. And it wasn't until the days of David and Solomon that the Jews learned how to smelt iron. And that gave the Hittites a tremendous uh, superiority in terms of military power. Because the rest of the world was going, at that time, was going through the Bronze Age. Uh, they were involved in making all their weapons out of bronze. And of course, iron can cut bronze. I mean, if you hit a, an iron sword against a bronze sword, which is going to win? It's going to be the iron sword. So the Hittites uh, had a tremendous military power. We find that uh, during the days of Solomon, Solomon shipped iron chariots to Egypt in exchange for horses. But because he was the middleman in between, he kept the balance of power going. He had a, a chariot city at Megiddo, whereby he had a thousand horses stabled there with chariots. So he was able to defend Israel. There are only three passes that go through uh, the 
Mount Carmel range which cuts at a diagonal across Israel and north of that is the Valley of Megiddo. We know it as Armageddon which comes from Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo where the final great battle with the Antichrist against Christ will take place someday. But through those, the, those mountains that run across there, there are three passes, Megiddo, Ibliam and Ta'anach. And Megiddo was the main passageway from north to south to get through for any trade that wanted to go through the land of Israel. And so Solomon controlled that balance of trade during this time between the Hittites in the north and the Egyptians down in the south. Something else that's very important to remember about the Hittites is that they were grossly immoral, and in fact perhaps some of the most immoral of all the ancient pagans in their worship. And uh, this is seen in the vile forms of worship that have been uncovered in the archaeological ruins. But as a people group in the Bible, they're mentioned 47 times under the name Hittites and 14 times more as the descendants of Heth for a total of 61 times. God puts them in some very interesting and important locations as we go through the Old Testament scripture. In Genesis chapter 10 verse 15 we discover that Heth, the progenitor of the Hittites, was the second son of Canaan. Canaan, you recall, was one of the sons of Ham. In fact, Ham was the youngest son of Noah, so we go back a long way. So we've got Noah, then we've got Ham, then we've got Canaan, and then we've got Heth. He goes back within that series of generations at the time of Noah. Genesis 10.15 says, And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn. And you all know of Tyre and Sidon and many of the prophecies in the Old Testament scripture concerning Tyre and Sidon, the judgments that Jesus pronounced against it. Uh, some incredible passages there that tie it together. Well, Sidon happened to be uh, the brother of Heth. Sidon is firstborn and Heth. After the shameful act that Heth, or excuse me, that Ham did with Noah when Noah was drunk, the curse of Noah was placed not on Ham himself, from whom came other sons like Mitzrayim, for example, who was the uh, father of uh, the Egyptians and Push and Put and others, those who go farther down into the African uh, continent. But it says that uh, the curse was not on Ham, but the curse was placed on Canaan. He's the ancestor of the Canaanites and of the Hittites. That's where the curse was placed on that particular descendant of Ham. Remember, what parents do will affect their descendants for many generations, but for the grace of God. God can break into that, and he does. For those who place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, many of these extended curses are broken. But notice here it says in Genesis 9.20, and following it says, And Noah began to be a husbandman and planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward. They saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him and said, not cursed be Ham, he said, cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. And God shall enlarge uh, Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So the Hittites are in that direct line under the curse of Canaan. In the days of Abraham, a group of Hittites were living in the vicinity of what we know as Hebron today. And it was from those Hittites that Abraham purchased the cave, as we see here in this passage, the cave of Machpelah, to use as a family burial site. Now you say, well, so what? Well, caves were very valuable <laughs> in the land of Israel, especially in, in the Judean hill country, which is solid rock. Just a little bit of dirt scattered here and there and a few depressions. Very difficult to bury people. And that's why as you look, for example, at pictures of the city of Jerusalem, and as you look at the eastern gate, the golden gate area, uh, you'll see all these graves, but they don't have headstones. What they have are sarcophagi sitting on top of the ground because you can't dig into the rock. And so they would bury them in these sarcophagi on top of the ground. And you'll see it both in the Christian cemetery, the Jewish cemetery on the Mount of Olives, and the Muslim cemetery, which is directly before uh, the what we would call the Golden Gate, though the real gate is down below the surface of the earth uh, that was there at the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a very valuable piece of property. It has a cave in it. Um, when Abraham purchased the cave, a formal legal ceremony took place that transferred the land uh, from the Hittites to Abraham. 
I think it's rather interesting also to notice uh, some observations that we gather as we read this text. First of all, do you remember? God had already promised to give this land to Abraham. But a cursed race had moved in first. And they had claimed it by squatter's rights. They'd named the area Mamre. It's later known as Hebron, but here it's called Mamre. It's interesting that God had Abraham follow man's laws and what we would call property laws, laws of transfer, until such time as God would give that land to Abraham's descendants by war in the days of Joshua. But Abraham, although God promised, I will give you all the land where on your foot treads, Abraham had to buy a portion of that which God had promised to Abraham and his descendants. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. The second thing that we see is when Abraham had a need, the Hittites were already in possession and Abraham did not contest their rights, although he had the promises of God. You know, you and I so often feel like we have to stand up for our rights. And we have certain rights that are given to us in Scripture. And we have rights in our country which are based upon Scripture. Life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and all kinds of things that are restated for us in our founding fathers' letters and different uh, writings. Those are things that they saw as divinely granted to us from heaven. But you know, we can lose those things. And the world, and always tries to do, will take them away if they possibly can. You see, Satan doesn't like the promises of God. Satan doesn't like those to whom God has given the promises. Satan will, if he can, for he is a, a thief and a murderer, as our Lord Jesus Christ said, will do everything he can to stop you from getting the promises of God. But we can walk by faith because we have a God who always fulfills the promises that he has made. He never fails on any of them. And so we see Abraham here, not worrying about it. When he has a need, they're in possession. They're in the superior bargaining position. He doesn't contest their rights. But you see, Abraham could not wait and say, well, maybe the price will come down after a couple of years. You know, that's the way we think. You know, well, you know, it's kind of expensive right now, but I'm looking at the market and I'm seeing how things are going. And pretty soon, instead of it being a seller's market, it's going to be a buyer's market. And, you know, we've gone through some dips like that, and some of you trying to sell homes and so on are experiencing the market at this point. Abraham couldn't wait. He's in a very hot climate. He has a dead wife. Decomposition has set in. He has to make a deal. And the Hittites know he has to make a deal. He's come to them for the purpose of burying Sarah, his wife, there. They also knew that Abraham was very rich and that he could afford it. Whatever they wanted to charge. You know, have you ever dealt with anybody who thought, you know, I think they can afford it. And so they really, really, you know, nailed you hard. We've had some of those situations where people, uh, you know, contractors who want to do work for the church here, they'll come and they look at these buildings and they look around and they think, hmm, I bet I can get a lot of money out of them. And they give us ridiculous prices. Uh, when we were looking for prices for doing the gutters along the side of this building, we came up with one uh, particular company that was a very good company, did excellent work. I went out and saw some of the work they did. They wanted about $350,000 to do the work. We ended up getting it for slightly over 60000 from another company just as qualified. <laughs> but you know, you see something like this and you say, man, I bet they've got money. How do we know that Abraham was wealthy besides the comment that they make here that you're a great prince among us and so on like that? Well, uh, we discover in Genesis 13 too, it says Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Genesis chapter 20, verse 16, we find out he gets a lot more silver. You recall that Abraham and Sarah had gone down into Egypt and there Abraham had lied about his wife Sarah and said, look, you know, you're a pretty good looking lady. Uh, when they ask, who are you? I uh, say, well, I'm Abraham's sister because, you know, if, if you say I'm his wife, they may kill me to take you. But if I'm just like your brother, then they'll really treat me well and they'll treat you well and, you know, everybody will be trying to cut these Middle Eastern deals, you know, and maybe we can get out of here before anything bad happens. And, of course, Pharaoh had immediately taken her into his harem. But God prevented him from doing anything to Sarah. 
And finally, God appeared to Abraham uh, to uh, Pharaoh in a vision and said, What in the world do you think you're doing? He says, Hey, I'm innocent of this. Uh, he says, You better get that man's wife back to him or I'm going to kill you. And uh, so uh, Pharaoh gave Sarah back to Abraham. And he did something else too to shame Sarah because of her lie. And it says this in Genesis 2016. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and all other. Thus she was reproved. And we won't go back into all that takes place there in that passage. But, but you recall we discussed that and how this was a reproof. And Abraham has a thousand pieces of silver. Now he's about to give 400 pieces of silver to bury Sarah, 40% of what he got from Pharaoh uh, for the lie that he and Sarah had told as he buries Sarah. The formal ceremony involves the entire clan of the Hittites. For this cave that we see here in Genesis 49, 29, it's not just one Hittite that he's dealing with, it's the entire clan so that nobody could later lay claim to that cave of Machpelah. It's the Hittite elders that he's petitioning to petition the owner who is Ephron the Hittite on behalf of Abraham. They would guarantee under Hittite law that the transfer was complete, that the transfer was permanent, although we see later on other nations coming in and taking possession of that land that Abraham paid for. The six that were buried there we've listed already. Rachel, of course, was buried outside of Bethlehem because she was in labor, gave birth, and died in childbirth as they were traveling past Bethlehem, Ephrata. And the bones of Joseph, though they're brought up out of Egypt at the Exodus 400 years later, are not buried here. They're buried in Shechem, as we've seen already in Joshua chapter 24, verse 32. And so Sarah was 127 years old. She died in Kiriath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. Abraham came to mourn Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord, thou art a mighty prince among us, and the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself unto the people. This all very formal ceremony in the gate of the city of the Hittites, even unto the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be in your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar. So Abraham's not dealing directly with Ephron. It's, he's dealing with the elders of the city. They're going to be the ones who, at the intermediaries, go between and ask Ephron if he'll sell the cave. Uh, they, of course, uh, will probably get some kind of a cut out of this, maybe even property taxes as he sells that property. We don't know. That's uh, speculation. That he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the land of his field. For as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a bearing place among you. The price of the property's worth just went up when Abraham says that. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me, the field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee, in the presence of the sons of my people give I it thee, bury thy dead. He's making an offer to give it. And as you recall, when we went over that passage of scripture, had he done that, he could have taken it back at any time. And so Abraham says, no, I'm not going to take it as a gift. I'm going to pay for it, and it's going to be certified by the elders of the city. And so um, Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? <laughs> Bury thy dead. <laughs> you know, no big deal. 400 shekels of silver. I know you're rich. I know you can afford it. 400 shekels of silver. That's the going price as of now. Well, of course, uh, Abraham has to pay a lot for that. If you stop and think about it for a few minutes, 400 shekels of silver. Joseph was sold into Egypt for 20 shekels of silver. Our Lord Jesus Christ was sold for 30 pieces of silver. This is 400 shekels of silver. That's a lot of money that Abraham has to pay for this piece of real estate. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver that he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant, and the field of Ephron, which was in Pilar, which is before Mamre, the field, and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that when all the borders round about were made sure 
unto Abraham for possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of the city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. Uh, so it starts off with a very important element of Abraham, the man who has the promises of God, the man who was promised this portion of real estate as a gift from God, actually have to pay 400 shekels of silver for it. We find that Esau married Hittite wives. That's mentioned to us in two chapters of the Old Testament. Esau was 40 years old when he took a, to wife Judas, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and Bashimat, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, which were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Here we find another major division in the, the promises of God. We find Jacob and Esau. Jacob, though he is a conniving sneak, is somebody who marries within the promised line and Esau chooses to marry Hittite women. Later he marries a daughter of Ishmael, also one who had been spun off of the line of promise. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And Ishmael, who is not in the line of promise, because Esau sees that it bothers his parents that he's married these two pagan Hittite women, goes out and takes a daughter of Ishmael to wife too, takes a third wife. Hittites here again at a very crucial point and juncture in the history of Israel. And they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Now these are the generations of Esau. Chapter 36 was Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughter of, daughters of Canaan. Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Aholabamah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hittite. And Bashamat, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nabajoth. We find that when Moses sent out the spies to spy out the land, the spies ran into Hittites in Numbers chapter 30, 13, 29. Those are part of the people of the land that scared the spies as they went in to spy out the land, and they came back and brought an evil report. Another critical juncture in the history of Israel, the Hittites show up. We find out that throughout the, uh, the uh, crossing over the, the sea into the land with Joshua, we find that the Hittites resisted and fought against Israel. In Joshua 9, 1 and 2, in chapter 11, verse 3, they're living in Canaan, and they fight against the children of Israel as they cross over into the promised land. We find that throughout Israel's Old Testament history, they lived very close to God's people. We find them just living in cities right outside of a number of the cities where the Jews lived. They always tried to stay close. Judges chapter 1 verse 26. Israel failed to drive them out of the land and as a result, some of them intermarried with the Jews, we discover. Brings us to the point of the doctrine of separation. That is a very important doctrine in Scripture. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Some incredible promises in the New Testament to those who obey the doctrine of separation. Some incredible judgments to those who refuse to obey. And we find that Israel refused to drive the Hittites completely out of the land. And as a result, those descendants of the Hittites began to intermarry with the Jews and caused tremendous problems. Did you know that some of the followers of King David were Hittites? They're listed for us in 1 Samuel 26.6. Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men, one of his most faithful warriors. He's the husband of Bathsheba, with whom David committed adultery and then had her husband killed in battle in 2 Samuel 11.3. What grief we see and what destruction we see and the kingdom of David as a result. The Hittites showing up once again at a crucial point of Israel's history because there had been no separation as God required and they had failed to drive them out of the land. We find Solomon had Hittite women in his harem in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 1. They were among the pagan wives that turned his heart from the Lord so that he sacrificed his children to pagan gods. You know, that's what always happens when there is intermarriage between believers and unbelievers. The children are the ones who suffer from that. And although we may no longer burn children to Moloch or to Baal, as they did back in those days, yet the children become sacrificed to the pagan gods of the world. And how often they are drawn away into wickedness and into sin and into you know, all the, 
the temptations of the world and into the idol of the world of covetousness. Many Christians have been tempted that way. Nehemiah 13.26 Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. And among those outlandish women were Hittites. Listen to 1 Kings 11.1 1. King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and Hittites. Hittites at a crucial juncture once again in the history of Israel. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as with the heart of David his father. For Solomon were after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then Solomon built an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon, and likewise did he for all his strange wives, including the Hittite ones, which burned incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Dear people, I can't emphasize the doctrine of separation strongly enough. Someday we'll do a whole sermon on that and talk about all the areas in which Christians are supposed to be separate that are listed for us in Scripture. We know about theological separation. We have a general idea about that. We know about uh, separation from worldliness, and we have a general idea about that. But the Word of God gives us many, many points at which we are called to be separate, distinct from the world around us, so that we might be holy unto the Lord our God. That is what God has called us to, holiness which, as the scripture tells us, without which no man shall see the Lord. That's a serious warning for those who would walk in the ways of the world. Sarah was buried by Abraham in this cave, Genesis 23, 19. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave in the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. Abraham was buried by Isaac and Ishmael in this cave, Genesis 25, 9. His sons Abraham, uh, Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephraim, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre. The other patriarchs were buried in this cave, as I mentioned a moment ago. It's a Muslim mosque today, still under the control of unbelievers because God has not yet fully given the land of Israel to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it will come, for God never fakes his promises. God never lies. God is always truthful. And God will fulfill precisely what he said to Abraham, every place that the foot of your soul shall tread, I have given that to you and to your descendants forever. Those are great promises that God is going to fulfill, and it will yet happen. Genesis 49 32, the purchase of the field into the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field of possession for a burying place from Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. Our time is running out, but I want to close with this. The world will always try to have an upper hand when we're in this life. The Hittites had moved in and squatted on the land that God had promised Abraham. Abraham had to buy it. Later, pagan nations came in and took the land by war and took it away from the children of Israel. We find that today it is under control of those who are unbelievers, those who are Muslims. But although the world always tries to get from you the things that God has promised you, God will, in the end, fulfill His promises. He will give to you what He has promised, and He will give it to you in full. Because God has called us to walk by faith, not by sight. God has called us to live a separated life, and in the end, God keeps the promises He has guaranteed. I think that's best summarized for us in Hebrews chapter 11, speaking of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and brings us down here to Genesis chapter 49 verse 53 where it says Jacob when he made an end of commanding his sons gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up his ghost and was gathered unto his people and we find that Joseph makes a uh, an announcement we're going to carry Jacob back like he made his promise we're going to bury him there in that cave and so they do in the next chapter we'll be talking about that in weeks to come but this is the heroes of faith and it brings us down to that point by faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed 
and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. In other words, he didn't get it in his lifetime he would have to receive for an inheritance. Isaac and Jacob didn't get it in their lifetime because they dwelt in tabernacles, but they were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah received her, herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Verse 12, Therefore sprang there even of one that is of Abraham, and him as good as dead, he's an old man, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith. Now listen to this next phrase. This is what faith is all about. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Faith is you hear the promise of God, you look at reality around you, and it is diametrically opposed to the promise that God has given. But you say, that doesn't matter. I'm going to trust what God said. Hey, I was promised this piece of real estate by God, and these other guys own it. I need it right now to bury my wife. They want 400 shekels of silver. That's a lot of money. But you know what? Hey, I'll pay for it. God has always met my needs. I don't have to worry about, man, you've really hit my bank account pretty hard. I don't need to go to war with them. Abraham goes to war with others. I mean, Abraham went to war with uh, the kings that came down and captured Sodom and Gomorrah and Admon and Zeboyim. Uh, you know, he tracked those kings all the way up the north, beat them with the 318 servants that were trained in his own house, tacked them by night. I mean, he was a military man. He knew what he could do. He didn't do that. He paid the 400 shekels of silver and said, I'll trust the promises of God. He saw those promises, it says, from afar off. It says, having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. He could have gone back to Ur of Chaldees anytime he wanted to. All the rest of the family was back in Ur of Chaldees, but he didn't do it. But now they desire a better country, and here's what we look for. And this is what you and I are given the promise of, that is, an heavenly country, Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Everything in this world looks like it's exactly contrary to the promises of God. Now you're going to have a choice. Are you going to believe what you see here in this world? Or are you going to believe the promises of God that he's given to us in the word of God? Are you going to walk by sight... Or are you going to walk by faith? And these are critical junctures in the life of Abraham. You think about Isaac. You think about God telling him to go and sacrifice your son. Abraham could have said, wait, wait a minute, God, I thought you weren't that kind of a God. I mean, that's the gods of the pagans. You know, those are guys who burn their kids to Moloch and all that kind of stuff. He didn't argue with God. Because he knew that he had a God who had made a promise concerning the children of his son Isaac, and Isaac was not yet married and had no children. He knew that God was able to raise him from the dead. It says so right here in the text. It says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And now it brings us down to our text for today. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. That brings us down to the end of Genesis chapter 49. That brings us down to the point at which Jacob finally yields up the ghost. We'll talk about that next week as we move from there into chapter 50. Gathers up his feet unto the bed, yielded up the ghost, and was gathered unto his people. Dear folks, someday that's going to happen to all of us that are in this room if our Lord tarries. There's going to come that last day, we utter our last breath, we say our last word, we give a sigh, and we depart to be with Christ. The question is, what kind of a testimony will we have left behind? Will it be a testimony of those who walk by faith? 
Will it be a testimony of those who believed the word of God? Will it be a testimony of those who looked around, they saw what the world was like? They said this seems absolutely contrary to the promises of God. But the promises of God say this. And I'm going to believe the promises of God, and I'm going to walk in harmony with the promises of God, and I'm going to do what the Word of God tells me to do, even though it looks like it's impossible. I'm going to walk by faith. If you take that road, you are demonstrating that you are a child of Abraham by faith. You are demonstrating that the great promises of God belong to you. You are demonstrating that you are not relying upon the flesh and upon all the human manipulations that we go through trying to make things work, but that you are relying upon the living God, who is the sovereign of the universe, who has ordained the end from the beginning, who is actively involved and in control of the lives of his children, who is bringing them through the different circumstances of life so that they might glorify him. That's what happens when we walk by faith. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of being in your presence this day as we have studied your word, as we have seen the great and precious promises, the intergenerational promises that you gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and to the twelve tribes. How we thank you, Father, for the way in which even this tiny little piece of real estate which Abraham had to purchase, which you had promised to give to him and to his descendants after him, that he and those who are listed for us in the scripture, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve tribes, those twelve sons, were strangers and pilgrims who wandered around on the earth and they had to buy a possession. And Jacob has to buy another possession up near Shechem and just so that they could have certain things, they had to buy them and you'd promise to give them to their descendants forever. Father, we know that your promises are true and that you will keep those promises and someday, because you are the sovereign God who owns the heavens and the earth, all others are merely renters here. You are the owner, the true owner, and you have the right to give to those who are your children that which pleases you. And Father, we know that you only give us those things which are for our good and for your glory. You only give us those things which you know that you can trust us with, for you know our hearts. And so, Father, you choose the things that you give us, even though we may want other things. You choose those things because you know that if you gave us something else, we would be irresponsible. We would not use it the way in which you had designed for it to be used. And so you entrust it to someone else who will be a steward of those possessions and those things. Help us, Father, not to become bitter over that. Help us not to wish something else. But help us to learn to be a thankful people. Those who are grateful at what you have done and the way in which you are directing our lives. And then, Father, cause us to walk by faith a separated life day by day, looking into the great and precious promises that we have reserved in store for us. And, Father, as we do so, help us to give a good testimony to the grace of Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. For we pray it in his name. Amen.